or BE and bioavailability or BA studies submitted to FDA to support NDAs and ANDAs through various regulatory pathways. Uh, Dr. Zhang is currently a senior staff fellow with the, of, uh, with the Office of Study Integrity and Surveillance, or OSIS. Um, Dr. Zhang has conducted, coordinated, and reviewed comprehensive FDA BMO clinical and analytical inspections covering BA, BE, PK, PD, immunogenicity, and animal rule studies in support of NDA, ANDA, BLA, and IND applications. Dr. Zhang has a PhD in um, cellular and molecular pharmacology, as well as a BS in pharmacy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cynthia Zhang. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am thrilled to be here today to give you a brief overview of the in vivo bioavailability and bioequivalent studies submitted to the FDA in support of new drug applications. The learning objectives of my talk today include to get familiar with the relevant laws and the regulations and the regulatory pathway, and to get a better understanding of the basis for measuring in vivo BA or demonstrating BE and also to gain a better understanding on the various types of evidence used to measure BA or establish BE. And here is the outline of my talk. First of all, let's talk about the relevant law and the regulations. In 1938, the Food, Drug, and the Cosmetic Act became one of the most comprehensive statutes in the history of American health law. In 1984, Congress passed the Drug Price Competition and the Patent Restoration Act, also called the Hatch-Waxman Act, which included sections 505b2 for new drug application, NDA, and section 505j abbreviated new drug application, ANDA. Code of Federal Regulation CFR Title 21, Part 314 and Part 320 also have dedicated sessions on this topic. Section 505 of the Act describes three types of new drug applications. The first one is 505B1, a standalone NDA that contains full reports of investigations of safety and effectiveness. The second type is 505B2. It's an ANDA that contains full reports of investigations of safety and effectiveness, but where at least some of the information required for approval comes from studies not conducted by or for the applicant and for which the applicant has not obtained a right of reference or use. The third type is 505J. It's an ANDA that contains information to show that the proposed product is identical in active ingredients, dosage form, strength, route administration, labeling, quality, and intended use among other things, to a previously approved product. When considering which regulatory pathway to submit a drug application, there is a FDA's guidance for industry titled, Determining Whether to Submit a ANDA or a 505B2 application, which was published in 2019. In general, several factors need to be considered from both regulatory and scientific perspective. The regulatory considerations include, first, duplicates. FDA generally will refuse to file a 505B2 application for a drug that is a duplicate of a listed drug and eligible for approval under 505J. Second, petitioned ANDAs. Certain differences between a reference listed drug and a proposed generic drug product may be permitted in an ANDA if those differences are the subject of an approved suitability petition. Three, bundling. In some circumstances, an applicant may seek approval for multiple drug 
containing the same active ingredients when some of these products would qualify for approval under both 505J and also um, qualify under 505B2. And the scientific considerations include, first, type of studies, data, and information submitted to the agency. Second, active ingredient sameness evaluation. And third, intentional differences between the proposed drug product and the reference list drug in formulation, BA, BE, conditions of use, and other differences. Here I am showing you a screenshot of CFR Title 21, Part 320. This part specifies the important regulatory requirements for bioavailability and bioequivalence. Now, let's take a look of some important definitions. Bioavailability, BA, is defined as the rate and extent to which the active ingredient or active moiety is absorbed from a drug product and it becomes available at the site of drug action. For drug products that are not intended to be absorbed into the bloodstream, BA may be assessed by scientifically valid measurements intended to reflect the rate and extent to which the active ingredient or active moiety becomes available at the site of drug action. Bioequivalence, BE, is defined as the absence of a significant difference in the rate and extent to which the active ingredient or active moiety in pharmaceutical equivalents or pharmaceutical alternatives becomes available at the site of drug action when administered at the same molar dose under similar conditions in an appropriately designed study. Again, where there is an intentional difference in rate, certain pharmaceutical equivalents or alternatives may be considered bioequivalent if there is no significant difference in the extent to which the active ingredient or moiety from each product becomes available at the site of drug action. Additionally, pharmaceutical equivalent describes identical dosage forms and routes of administration with identical amounts of the identical active drug ingredient. Pharmaceutical alternative describes identical therapeutic moiety or its precursor, but not necessarily in the same amount or dosage form or the same salt or ester. Please note that therapeutic equivalence usually means combination of pharmaceutical equivalent and a bioequivalence. Part 320, section 23, specifies basis for measuring BA. For drug products that are intended to be absorbed into the bloodstream, the measured concentrations of the active drug ingredient in the blood, urinary excretion rates, or pharm pharmacological effects would be compared to the reference material in its rate and extent of absorption. For drug products that are not intended to be absorbed into the bloodstream, the rate and extent to which the active ingredient or active moiety becomes available at the site of action should be reflected by using scientifically valid measurements. Part 320, Section 23 specifies basis for demonstrating BE. For drug products intended to be absorbed into the bloodstream, Two drug products, test and reference, are considered bioequivalent if they are pharmaceutical equivalents or pharmaceutical alternatives, and their rate and extent of absorption do not show a significant difference when administered at the same molar dose of the active moiety under similar experimental conditions, either single dose or multiple dose. Their extent of absorption do not show a significant difference with different rates of absorption because such differences in the rate of absorption are intentional and are reflected in the labeling. For drug products are not intended to be absorbed into the bloodstream, BE may be demonstrated by scientifically valid methods that are expected to detect a significant difference between the drug and the listed drug in safety and therapeutic effect. 
Here is the latest edition of the Orange Book. The FDA's approved drug products with therapeutic evaluations, which was published in 2022. From there, you can find drug products that are considered to be therapeutically equivalent to other pharmaceutically equivalent products with the A codes. Also, drug products that FDA at this time considers not to be therapeutically equivalent to other pharmaceutically equivalent products with the B codes. More details can be found via the reference link below. Please note that in March 2020, FDA removed from the Orange Book the listings for biological products that have been approved in applications under Section 505 of the FDNC Act because these products are no longer listed drugs. Part 320, Section 24 describes types of evidence to measure BA or establish BE. Specifically, FDA may require in vivo or in vitro testing, or both. And the selection of the method used to meet requirement depends upon the purpose of the study, the analytical methods available, and the nature of the drug product. The most accurate, sensitive, and reproducible approach available shall be used. In my talk today, I will focus only on the in vivo testing, and my co-worker will speak more on the in vitro testing in、um, her、uh, presentation later. The first type of evidence is generated from an in vivo test. In which the concentration of the active ingredient or active moiety, and when appropriate, its active metabolites in whole blood, plasma, serum, or other appropriate biological fluid, is measured as a function of time. Those are the BAB studies with pharmacokinetics endpoints in biological samples, like whole blood, plasma, and serum. It's considered as the most accurate, sensitive, and reproducible approach. And it's particularly applicable to dosage forms intended to deliver the active moiety to the bloodstream for systemic distribution within the body. The second type of evidence generated from an in vivo test, in which the urinary excretion of the active moiety, or when appropriate, its active metabolites, are measured as function of time. These are BAB studies with PK endpoints in the biological samples, like urine. The measurement intervals should be as short as possible to ensure the measured rate of elimination as accurate as possible. It's applicable to certain category of dosage forms, and it's not appropriate where urinary excretion is not a significant mechanism of elimination. Next type of evidence is from an in vivo test in which an appropriate acute pharmacological effect of the active moiety, and when appropriate, its active metabolites are measured as a function of time. If such effect can be measured with sufficient accuracy, sensitivity, and reproducibility, these are BAB studies with pharmacodynamic PD endpoint. It's particularly applicable to dosage forms that are not intended to deliver the active moiety to the bloodstream for systemic distribution. Next type of evidence is from well-controlled clinical trials that establish the safety and effectiveness of the drug product for purpose of measuring BA, or appropriately designed comparative clinical trials for purpose of demonstrating BE. Those are the studies with clinical endpoints. It's considered as the least accurate, sensitive, and reproducible approach. It may be considered sufficiently accurate of dosage forms intended to deliver the active moiety locally. Additional types of evidence to measure BA or establish BE include an in vitro test. That has been correlated with and is predictive of human in vivo bioavailability data (IV IVC), or are currently available in vitro tests acceptable to FDA 
that ensures human in vivo bioavailability. And any other approach deemed adequate by FDA to measure BA or establish BE. In addition to the law and regulations, FDA also issues guidance documents to provide the current thinking of the agency on specific topics. Product specific guidance are also available on the FDA website. Please feel free to follow the links to find some of the examples of the guidance documents I listed here. In summary, my presentation today covered relevant law, regulations, and the regulatory pathways for the in vivo BAB studies. And I hope it helps you gaining a better understanding on the basis and types of evidence for measuring in vivo BA or demonstrating BE. Now let's try some challenge questions. Question number one, true or false? In vivo BAB studies may only be submitted to support ANDAs under 505J pathway only. A true, B false. The answer is B, false. In vivo BAB studies may also be submitted to support uh, NDAs under 505B2 pathway. Challenge question number two. Which type of evidence may be used to measure BA or establish BE? A, comparative PK. B, comparative PD. C, comparative clinical endpoint. D, in vitro in vivo correlation, IVIVC, and E, all of the above. The answer is E, all of the above. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Anna Jevinia, um, providing an overview of commonly used in vitro BE approaches for determining product BE, followed by Dr. Kara Scheibner, providing a brief introduction to the concept of immunogenicity response of therapeutics. Um, Dr. Monica Javinia is a staff fellow in the OSIS Division of Generic Drug Study Integrity. She earned her PhD in pharmacology from Georgetown University and has experience in the conduct and review of clinical and analytical studies. Dr. Javinia also has a special interest in drugs and biologics for neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, Dr. Kara Schneider is a pharmacologist in the Division of Generic Drug Bioequivalence Evaluation within OSIS. Um, she earned her BS in pharmacology slash toxicology from the University of Sciences in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and a PhD in pharmacology and molecular sciences from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. And she has worked with FDA as a pharmacologist since July of 2014. Please join me in welcoming our next presenters. Thank you for having me, and thank you to everyone for joining us for this webinar. I'm a staff fellow in the Division of Generic Drug Study Integrity, and I'll be giving an overview of in vitro bioequivalent studies today. As a disclaimer, this presentation reflects my views and should not be construed to represent FDA's views or policies. The learning objectives for today's presentation are to understand why an in vitro study may be used to establish bioequivalence, which I will refer to as BE moving forward. To identify resources to aid with in vitro BE study selection and development. And to describe types of in vitro BE studies. 21 CFR Part 320 states that FDA may require in vivo or in vitro testing or both to measure the bioavailability of a drug product or establish the bioequivalence of specific drug products. Thus, the contents of this presentation can be seen as standalone or complementary to that of my colleague, Dr. Zhang, who presented on in vivo BE studies earlier today. So why conduct an in vitro BE study? Well, for one, in vivo BE studies can be expensive and time consuming. 
And of course, when working with human subjects, there's always a risk. There are many cases when in vivo BE studies are necessary, but sometimes in vitro BE studies are the best way to establish bioequivalence. The following resources are not specific to in vitro BE studies, but will aid in the selection and design of in vitro studies. Additional, more specific resources can be found on FDA.gov. So you have a drug and you want to know how to determine BE. The first place to look is on the FDA website for product specific guidances or PSGs. These guidance documents provide recommendations on how to generate evidence in support of an ANDA, including but not limited to study types and design, drug strengths to use, analytes to measure, and waiver options. The uniqueness of in vitro BE studies is really highlighted by the PSGs. Often for in vivo, you'll see a two-way, two-period, fasted and fed design. For in vitro options, there are many study types unique to the type of drug, and I'll describe some of these during my presentation. A key component of BE studies is the comparison of the test product to the reference standard. The Orange Book is an important resource for identifying the appropriate reference listed drug to use as a reference standard for in vitro BE studies. Similarly, the Purple Book details biological products and can be used for biosimilar development and to identify interchangeable biologics. If for some reason the reference listed drug is no longer available, for example, the drug is no longer marketed or there's a shortage, FDA may select a different drug to serve as the reference standard. Now let's get into study types. There are many types of in vitro BE studies that serve different purposes and depend on the type of drug being tested. For example, in vitro permeability or release testing for dermatological products, or in vitro binding testing for bile acid sequestrants. There are a few types of in vitro size distribution studies, globule, particle, or liposome, that some drugs, for example, some types of ophthalmic products may be eligible for. Lastly, there are in vitro aerosol studies using a five test or six test battery, depending on whether it's inhaled or a nasal product. There are more types of in vitro studies. To stay on time, I will not cover them in this presentation. I will say though, there are biopharmaceutics classification system or BCS best BCS-based biowaivers, and if a drug you're developing is eligible, tests like BCS dissolution, solubility, and permeability can be used in support of the waiver. I'll spend most of the time in this presentation covering IVRT and IVPT studies. These are in vitro methods for testing semi-solid topical dermatological products. These drugs are typically not candidates for in vivo studies with traditional PK endpoints, but could be tested with clinical endpoints such as skin redness, itching, and rash assessment, depending on the goal of the drug. I would also like to note that IVRT can be used for other formulations, but for this talk, I will describe it in terms of dermatological products. The image on the right-hand side shows a Franz diffusion cell, one type of apparatus used for these studies. The membrane and drug are loaded on the top of the apparatus, and the bottom contains a solution, either alcoholic for IVRT studies or physiological for IVPT studies. The solution is sampled from the sampling port throughout the study, and the stir bar on the bottom helps to ensure the drug in receptor solution is homogeneous. Some major differences between the two methods. IVRT uses a synthetic membrane, while IVPT uses human skin. Thus, the results from IVRT experiments are more consistent, while IVPT can show donor variability. IVRT experiments have a thick, occluded, infinite, or rather a pseudo-infinite dose, while IVPT has a thin film, finite dose. IVRT results generate steady state release rate, or slope, while IVPT results show the flux profile with maximum flux and decline in flux. Importantly, IVRT is not expected to correlate with or predict in vivo bioavailability and bioequivalence, but IVPT does have the expectation of in vitro in vivo correlation. Preparation-wise, both IVRT and IVPT studies 
we'll have method development and method validation. Method development is largely used to establish the testing parameters, such as the dose amount, sampling schedule, and stir rate. IVRT will have a single study with two six cell experiments as illustrated, but more if needed. IVPT will typically include both a pilot and a pivotal study. The pilot is often performed with skin from four to six donors, four or more replicates per donor per, per treatment, and three parallel treatments of test, reference, and another product with a different flux profile. This study helps to estimate the number of donors and replicates that will be needed for the pivotal study, since as I mentioned earlier, there is donor skin variability. The in vitro recommendations depend on the type of drug being tested, and there can be substantial differences from drug to drug. The PSGs for some drugs may recommend both IVRT and IVPT testing, while others like benzyl alcohol lotion recommend IVRT and a lice assay. I'll use acyclovir 5% topical cream as an example. The test and reference product should be qualitatively Q1 and quantitatively Q2 the same, with no difference in inactive ingredients or anything that may significantly alter the availability of active ingredients. There are several additional tests falling under Q3, comparing a minimum of three lots of test and three lots of reference product. This includes analyses of visual appearance, the acyclovir polymorphic form in the drug product, particle size distribution and crystal habit, rheological behavior, and other relevant tests like pH, specific gravity, and water activity. For this product, both IVRT and IVPT are recommended. And there's also the in vivo clinical endpoint option with a randomized, double-blind, parallel, three-arm, placebo-controlled study of participants with recurrent herpes labialis. There are some really great resources for more information on IVRT and IVPT. Information on performance testing of semi-solid drug products can be found in USP General Chapter 1724. Additionally, FDA and the Center for Research on Complex Generics, CRG, CRCG, hosted a free virtual public workshop in August 2021 on IVRT and IVPT methods best practices and scientific considerations for ANDA submissions, which is an excellent resource for more information. Another FDA public workshop included a great talk, which I've also linked in the slides. Now let's move on to in vitro binding testing. Briefly going back to the Code of Federal Regulations, I think this part really highlights why in vitro binding testing is important. It states, for drug products that are not intended to be absorbed into the bloodstream, bioequivalence may be demonstrated by scientifically valid methods that are expected to detect a significant difference between the drug and the listed drug in safety and therapeutic effect. Unlike the previous section on IVRT and IVPT with in vivo clinical endpoint studies being an option, phosphate or bile acid binding drugs do not enter the bloodstream and in vitro binding studies are the only study type recommended. In vitro binding testing comprises two types of tests, equilibrium, considered the pivotal BE study, and kinetic testing. Unbound analytes are measured in filtrate to determine the amount of phosphate or bile acids bound to resin. Equilibrium and kinetic testing helps to determine the extent and rate of binding affinity of the test and reference products. There are some differences in the study designs depending on the drug being tested. For example, both the equilibrium and kinetic binding studies for Sevelimer carbonate powder for suspension are with and without acid pretreatment at pHs 4 and 7. pH 7 is about where maximum phosphate binding happens. In contrast, the equilibrium binding study for cholesterimine powder is with and without acid pretreatment at pH 6 in a simulated intestinal fluid, and the kinetic study is without acid pretreatment. In equilibrium testing, eight or more concentration of phosphate or bile salts are tested until maximum binding. For kinetic, two concentrations are tested for eight or more periods of time until maximum binding. For more specific details, please refer to the product-specific guidance documents. 
There's always an exception to the rule, so I'll give a special example of sucralfate oral suspension. In addition to equilibrium and kinetic binding studies with bile salts, it is recommended to conduct equilibrium binding studies with BSA or HSA, as well as an in vitro enzyme activity study. Now we'll get into in vitro aerosol studies. Inhaled and nasal in vitro aerosol studies actually have a lot in common. Both have single actuation content, SAC, to characterize the drug discharged in relation to the container life. Both have spray pattern, as the name implies, to characterize the spray on a target at different distances. There are also plume geometry tests, which involve photographs of the aerosol cloud from the side view that are then quantified. Both also have priming and repriming studies, which demonstrate the product will work consistently and reliably after dropping, for example, and then storing again. The main difference between inhaled and nasal products are that inhaled will have aerodynamic particle size distribution and nasal will have droplet size distribution. APSD measures the particle and airflow and the droplet size distribution measures the geometric droplet size in flight. I will discuss size distribution studies in the next section. Nasal in vitro aerosol studies also quantify the mass of drug in small droplets. If you're interested, there is a draft guidance for bioavailability and bioequivalent studies for nasal aerosols and nasal sprays for local action. For in vitro aerosol studies, both in vitro and in vivo uh, studies are commonly recommended. For example, for albuterol sulfate, a metered aerosol for inhalation, the five test in vitro battery is recommended in addition to an in vivo PK study design as um, a single dose two-way crossover study measuring albuterol in plasma. Next, I'll go over some aspects of size distribution studies. As I mentioned earlier, there are three types of size distribution studies, in vitro globule size distribution, particle size distribution or PSD, and in vitro liposome size distribution study. Size distribution studies are important for helping us understand and ensure the product performance. There are different formulations these studies can be used for, uh, such as liposomes, emulsions, suspensions, and aerosols. Further, the specific methods will vary depending on the drug of interest, including formulation and size, and what experiments are best suited to give the data required. I'll use cyclosporine ophthalmic emulsion as an example. The in vitro option recommends Q1 and Q2 sameless, sameness, comparable Q3, tested on at least three batches of test and three batches of reference products. The parameters to measure include, among other tests, globule size distribution using a dynamic light scattering method, sometimes known as quasi-elastic light scattering, QELS, or photon correlation spectroscopy, PCS. This method helps us understand the diffusion behavior of molecules in solution. In brief, Brownian motion is the random movement of particles in suspension, with smaller particles diffusing more quickly and larger particles diffusing more slowly. By apply, applying lasers, we can see light scattering at fluctuating intensities due to the Brownian motion. But I know people did not come here today for a physics lesson, and I am absolutely not qualified to be giving one. Alternatively, an in vivo BE study could be conducted using a randomized double-blind parallel placebo-controlled trial. There is a great video available that provides more information on the Q3 testing linked in the slides. Thank you all for your attention. At this point, let's do a couple challenge questions. Challenge question number one, which of the following statements is not true? A, reference standards can be identified using the yellow book. B, Acceptable study types are described in the product-specific guidances. C. If a reference-listed drug is unavailable, FTA may select a new one to serve as a reference standard. And D. The Purple Book details licensed biological products. 
The correct answer is A. Reference standards can be identified using the yellow book. The orange book is the appropriate resource. Challenge question number two. Which of the following are components of in vitro aerosol studies? A, single actuation content. B, spray pattern. C, plume geometry. And D, all of the above. The correct answer is D, all of the above. In summary, in vitro BE studies can be conducted with or instead of in vivo BE studies, and they can vary greatly and are highly dependent upon the drug and formulation. If there's one thing you take from this talk, I hope it's that the product-specific guidances are your best friends. There is, are, however, still guidances and not the law of the land. If uh, the sponsor wishes so, they could choose to use methods other than what is recommended in the PSG. And if that's the case, they may contact OGD for a consultation. Thank you all for your time and attention. Unfortunately, I will be unavailable for questions, but I leave you in the very capable hands of my colleague, Dr. Mahadevan, for the upcoming Q&A panel discussion portion. Good morning, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today about immunogenicity and biosimilars. Let's first take a look at the learning objectives for this talk. I'll give a brief introduction to biosimilars and the regulatory pathways that apply to them. And I'll spend most of our time on the types of clinical studies critical for biosimilar applications. I'll, I'll briefly mention PK studies, but the emphasis will really be on immunogenicity assays, study design, and the tiered assay system used in immunogenicity assays. But first, Let's discuss what are biosimilars. The FDA defines biosimilars as, quote, a biological product that is highly similar to and has no clinically meaningful differences from an existing FDA approved reference product, unquote. But why do we use the word similar instead of equivalent? So first of all, small molecules are synthesized and thus their active ingredients are exactly the same as that in the reference product but large molecules are generated with recombinant technology using mammalian cell lines. Because of the physiological processes inherent in production, there can be minor changes to the molecule from events such as post-translational modifications. And furthermore, the changes can well change from production batch to production batch, and thus we derive the name biosimilar. Just as an FYI, some examples of approved biosimilars include adalimumab, pegfilgrastum, and infliximab. Now that we understand the similar piece, what does the definition mean by no clinically meaningful differences? First, the mechanism of action of the biosimilar must be exactly the same as the reference product. Second, they must have the same route of administration, the same dosage form, and the same strength. And finally, they must elicit the same clinical efficacy and there can be no differences in the drug safety profiles. Biosimilars can, in a way, be thought of roughly as the generics of the large molecule world. But keep in mind that there are very significant and important differences between generics and biosimilars. For example, immunogenicity, which will be the emphasis of this talk. Biosimilars are regulated by different pathways than generic drugs. Biological products are regulated under Section 351 of the Public Health Service or PHS Act, and biosimilars are specifically regulated under Section 351K. 351K defines the requirements for biosimilar applications and is an abbreviated licensure pathway for biologics. It also defines that a biosimilar must be evaluated against a reference product licensed under 351A. Despite the fact that biosimilars are licensed under the PHS Act, there are elements of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that still apply to these applications. 
I've included a link in this slide to some important and helpful references for biologics applications. In addition to the regulations for biosimilars, there are multiple guidances available on FDA's website. I've left, listed several of them here as an FYI, and again, I've included a link where you can search all of the FDA guidance documents available. Per Section 351K, the following types of data are required to be a part of a biosimilar application. First, analytical data must demonstrate the similarity of the biosimilar to the reference product. This type of data can include structural and functional characterization, stability studies, manufacturing processes, etc. Second, there must be toxicity data from animal studies. And finally, Clinical data must demonstrate efficacy and safety using pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, and immunogenicity data. I want to spend one slide on PK studies for biosimilars because these data are critical to a biosimilar application. PK and PD studies should be conducted in normal, healthy human populations, similar to a bioequivalent study for generic drugs. However, biosimilar PK and PD studies can also be conducted in the eventual target patient population, and these studies often include multiple doses over an extended study period. Large molecule PK studies will mostly be analyzed using plate-based ligand-binding assays that should be able to accurately and precisely quantitate drug concentrations for the biosimilar and reference drug or drugs. The important PK parameters are similar to those used in bioequivalent studies, for example, the Cmax and area under the curve, and the acceptance range of 80 to 125 percent with a 90 percent confidence interval should also be familiar. Some biosimilars will also require PD studies, for example, the absolute neutrophil counts for a filgrastim or peg filgrastim biosimilar. The rest of my talk will be completely devoted to immunogenicity studies. And why is that? For biosimilar studies, the rate of immunogenicity is critical data required for approvability. Immunogenicity can affect the efficacy and or safety of a biosimilar product by preventing the drug target interaction, increasing drug clearance, inducing aggregation of the drug, and inducing steric changes to the drug. And not only could any of these incidences lead to a loss of efficacy, they could also increase adverse reactions, including injection site reactions or anaphylaxis. In extreme cases, when the biosimilar mimics an endogenous protein, for example, erythropoietin, anti-drug antibodies could inhibit not only the drug, but the endogenous protein as well, which could be catastrophic. This slide shows an example of how anti-drug antibodies can affect drug efficacy. The development of ADAs against TNF-alpha antagonists is common, and it often occurs within the first six months of treatment. ADAs against these drugs are associated with diminished drug availability and reduced efficacy. A 2015 study of rheumatoid arthritis patients receiving infliximab demonstrated an ADA rate of 40% accompanied by a reduction in serum drug levels. The graphs below show an increasing rate of ADAs over time on the x-axis with concurrent decreases in drug concentrations on the y-axis. And this effect is why immunogenicity studies are critical for biosimilar applications. So how do we assess immunogenicity? It is typically assessed as part of clinical study data in addition to PK and PD data. And the rate of ADAs generated from the biosimilar is compared to the ADA rate of the reference product. Most BE studies are conducted using a crossover design where every subject receives one dose of test product and one dose of reference product with a washout period in between. This study design can still be used for biosimilar PK assessments, but is not ideal for assessing immunogenicity. Immunogenicity assessments should be conducted using a parallel design. And why is this? So first, the development of ADAs takes time. And once they're present, they tend to have long half-lives, 
so they hang around for a while. Thus, typical washout periods used in crossover studies is not sufficient, and it becomes impossible to distinguish ADAs generated in response to the biosimilar versus those generated from the reference drug. Also, parallel design studies are much more conducive to the multi-dose studies frequently used for biosimilars. Now I'm going to complicate things even more. A biosimilar must be compared to the U.S. licensed reference product. It cannot, for example, be compared to an EU licensed reference product. However, frequently sponsors may have extensive data for the non-US licensed product. And in these instances, a parallel bridging study design can be used. A bridging study will compare one, the biosimilar to the US licensed reference product, two, the biosimilar to the EU licensed reference product, and three, the US and EU licensed reference products to each other. These studies are conducted in a three-arm parallel design visualized in this diagram. And once the trials are designed and conducted, how is immunity and immunogenicity assessed on the analytical side of things? Later today, I'll be speaking much more in depth on that topic, so stay tuned. But for now, I'll give you a few of the basics for detecting ADAs generated in response to treatment. Multiple types of assays can be used from plate-based ligand binding assays, think ELISA's or electric chemiluminescence assays, to cell-based assays, to radioimmunoassays. One important item to note is that ADA assays are typically semi-quantitative. A finite concentration of ADAs, such as that derived in drugs from a PK assay, will not be possible in these assay formats. ADAs are also a little more involved and complex than a typical PK assay because they are done using a tiered assay system. So what is this tiered assay system you speak of? And that's a great question, so here is a general overview. Tier one consists of what we call a screening assay. And a screening assay should be one, highly sensitive, two, rapid, and three, err on the site of false positive results. The screening assay is the first line assessment for ADAs and negative samples from this assay will not be assessed again. All positive samples from the tier one assay are moved to tier two or the confirmatory assay. And this is where we weed out the false positive results and drill down to the true ADA positive samples. Confirmatory assays may be less sensitive than screening assays, but are also more highly specific. Samples confirming ADA positive move to the tier three or titration assay. This is where the semi-quantitative nature of the assay that I mentioned on the previous slide comes in. The titration assay is used to obtain a relative level of ADAs in positive samples and generally uses the same highly sensitive assay format used in the tier one screening assay. And after tier three, ADA positive samples will typically go on to another type of assay used to determine whether the ADAs detected are neutralizing antibodies. Neutralizing antibodies are a subset of ADAs that bind to the drug and inhibit its pharmacological action. These are the specific ADAs that contribute to treatment failure and other efficacy and safety issues and are the most clinically relevant ADAs. Thus, it is very important to know if neutralizing antibodies are being generated. All samples confirming positive for ADAs should be moved to a specific assay to detect neutralizing antibodies. Many NAB assays are conducted using plate-based ligand binding assays, similar to ADA assays. However, cell-based assays are frequently used to assess the NAB effect on a specific biological response of the drug. For example, cell growth, apoptosis, cytokine release, or phosphorylation. As always, there are pros and cons to each type of assay, and the assay format used should be carefully chosen based on the mechanism of the drug. The final thing I'd like to mention here is that there are some unique challenges that come with assessing the immunogenicity of large molecules, some of which also apply to PK assays as well. 
I'll go through a few items here briefly, but again, I will be going into these topic, topics in much greater depth this afternoon. The first item is the concept of drug tolerance in immunogenicity assays. There can be interference in the assay from the actual drug itself. Second, there can be target interference in the assay, where the actual drug target may bind to assay components and interfere with the assay. Third, matrix effects play a much larger role in these types of assays compared to small molecule assays because the sample processing is minimal. Things like rheumatoid factor, soluble receptors, and nonspecific binding proteins can all interfere with the assay. And finally, pre-existing antibodies can be a factor in assessing assay results. Trying to optimize an assay to balance sensitivity and specificity while simultaneously trying to account for all potential interferences is not easy and can be tricky. Assay optimization during method development is highly important for these types of assays to ensure reliable results. Now, to see if I've done my job, here are a few challenge questions. Challenge question number one, is the following statement true or false? Under 351K of the PHS Act, biosimilars must be demonstrated to be highly similar to and have no clinically meaningful differences from an existing reference product licensed in the US or elsewhere. This statement is false. The reference product must be the US licensed reference product. Challenge question number two, which of the following study designs can be used in a biosimilar application? A, crossover design, B, parallel design, C, bridging design, D, all of the above. The answer is D, all of the above. Applicants may use a crossover design to assess PK, but also implement a parallel design strategy for immunogenicity studies. And a bridging design can always be used when appropriate. With that, I'd once again like to thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today, and I look forward to any questions during the speaker panel. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent presentations. We will now have our session two Q&A panel in place of Dr. Monica Javidnia. If we will, uh, joining the panel is Dr. Gajendiran Mahadevan. Uh, Dr. Mahadevan is a pharmacologist who joined the, F the agency as an FDA commissioner fellow in the Center for Veterinary Medicine and later moved to the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research um, in OSIS. He has been involved in the bio research monitoring program for um, conducting inspections and um, alternative inspections. If you haven't had a chance to enter your question into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. All right, and um, we'll go ahead and start with a question for Dr. Zhang. Um, Dr. Chang, where can I find information to help design BA or BE studies? Thank you for that question. Um, please refer to the relevant law and regulations, as well as the FDA's guidance documents. For example, the 2021 guidance bioequivalent studies with pharmacokinetic endpoints for drugs submitted under an abbreviated new drug application and also the 2022 guidance, bioavailability studies submitted in NDAs or INDs, general considerations. The agency has also been publishing product specific guidances, which provide additional details on requirements for specific drug products. Um, additionally, FDA also provides multiple communication channels with the review divisions. I guess it depends on the applications, um, you have um, corresponding review divisions like OGD or OND or OCP and OPQ. Um, and you can communicate with them um, during, for example, the product development meetings, pre-submission meetings, mid-cycle review meetings, post-complete response letter meetings, 
um, yeah, pretty much at various stages to address the industry's questions for specific generic drug development and the regulatory approval. Right. Thank you for that information. Another question for you, Dr. Zhang. Is the in vivo BE study always preferred over the in vitro BE study? That's a great question. Uh, the short answer is not necessarily. As mentioned in my presentation, FDA may require in vivo or in vitro testing or both to measure BA or establish BE of the drug products. The selection of the method used to meet requirement depends on the purpose of the study, the analytical methods available, and the nature of the drug products. Also, you shall use the most accurate, sensitive, and the reproducible approach available. Great, thank you for that information. Another question for you. Uh, do you need to maintain retention samples? And if so, how much? Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, because the BAB studies are subject to 21 CFR 320, um, 38, and 320, 63. So the sites conducting the, the studies is responsible for randomly selecting and retaining reserve samples um, provided by the applicant for subject dosing for the in vivo studies. Um, you may also find additional information uh, from the final rule for retention of bioavailability and bioequivalence testing samples uh, published in 1993, uh, which specifically addresses the requirement uh, for BE studies. Um, there are also multiple guidance documents available uh, talking about the handling and retention of BAB testing samples. For example, the 2004 guidance and also the newly published 2020 guidance on the compliance policy for the quantity of bioavailability and the bioequivalence sample retained under 21 CFR 320 38C. Um, additionally, my colleague, Dr. Paul Ye, will also speak on the reserve sample requirements for BABE studies later this afternoon. All right, thank you so much for that information. Um, we've got one more question that came in for you. Um, why are biosimilars removed from the orange book? Are they listed in another place? Yeah, thank you for that question as well. Um, actually, as, as mentioned in Monica's presentation, uh, FDA uses the purple book now. Uh, which is a resource that lists innovator biological products, as well as any biosimilar and interchangeable biological products licensed by FDA under the Public Health Service Act, the PHS Act. Um, the primary purpose of the purple book is twofold. Uh, one is to enable a user to see if a biological product licensed under Section 351K of the PHS Act has been determined by FDA to be biosimilar to or interchangeable with a reference biological product, um, and also to provide information on any existing reference product exclusivity protecting a reference biological product. And I hope that answers the question. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Now we'll move on to um, some questions that came in for um, Monica, but that will be addressed by um, Gosha during this uh, Q&A panel. Um, first question, what is the availability of historical versions of a product in PSG on the US FDA website? Thank you, Nora, for that question. Um, historical version of a product specific guidance are not available uh, at the uh, US FDA website. However, when you s only the current version is available, however, uh, at the bottom of the that product specific guidance, uh, you can see the, the bottom uh, left hand corner, you can see the previous uh, years of uh, the product specific guidance published. Um, it's always go to go to the, the, the current version of the product specific guidance. So if you need more information, please reach out to the office of um, 
generic drug uh, office of generic drugs uh, you know publishes the product specific guidance if you need further information please reach out to the ojd thanks all right thank you for that response um here is another question that came in um for you can uh, being used in silico studies for be determination so uh, I have been here for a while, but I, I never come across any silico studies for B determination. However, you know, of course, you know, FDA is, you know, always, you know, uh, it's a science-based agency. So if you need more information about the use of uh, these studies for bio, uh, bioequivalence determination, please reach out to Office of uh, Genetic Drugs. So they will provide you the guidance. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, uh, another question for you. Um, I guess this is regarding Monica's presentation. Um, you restrict your presentation to vertical diffusion cell or FRAN cell, while USP 1724 um, describes also immersion cell and flow through cell. Any rationale to support this? Um, moreover, IVRT can be used for other dosage forms such as emulsions or suspensions. Can you confirm that any alternative in vitro dissolution method is deemed suitable, assuming that it is discriminating and validated? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so much uh, for that question. Um, yeah, Monica, um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Monica Javinia, Presented, uh, you know, the vertical diffusion cell. There's a fran cell diffusion study because it's a uh, due to limited, you know, time. So she just uh, picked up one. It's this. Uh, if you see that her title is a an overview of in vitro bioequivalence studies. So it's not exhaustive. It's only an example she provided. Of course, you did uh, bring a great question. Use of uh, dissolution in vitro dissolution method using a flow through cell or immersion cell. Um, yeah, the first thing is that uh, please go to the, the product specific guidance webpage in the web, FDA website, uh, choose the right product. You know, if you, if you choose a drug and make sure that you are choosing the right product, sometimes it's tablet, capsule, suspension. These are, the, uh, you know, different products available. Make sure that you choose a right product for the right, uh, product specific guidance, go through that. And if you have any question, please reach out to OGD for any further clarification. Yes, of course, you can use flow through cell and immersion cell. And uh, of course, you know, as you mentioned that, you know, this method has to discriminate and uh, you have to validate, you have to develop the method and validate the method before doing the bioequivalence determination. Thank you very much for that question. All right, thank you. Another question for you related. Um, is there any guidance paper for sulcroflate? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, this was published, um, let me see. This was published in 2017. Um, yeah, sucral, uh product specific guidance is available for sucral fat and um, and also the previous as uh, uh, just wanted to find out that you know someone asked that the previous version of the the product specific guidance if you see that uh, 2014 there was a previous product specific guidance published for sucral fat um, please use the current version of the uh, product specific guidance and if you have any question please reach out to office of generic drugs All right, thank you. One more question for you, uh, Dr. Mahadevan. Uh, what is the frequency for the PSG updating? Okay, this is a great question. Yeah, so in the Office of Genetic Drugs, they have a dedicated um, division um, to look into the product of guidance. They they go through uh, you know uh, this guidance uh, regularly, and if needed, they um, uh, update the guidance. As I mentioned before, so for example. For fate, 2014, there was a guidance published. So after three years, uh, it was updated in 2017. Yeah, they do regularly um, review the product specific guidance available for a particular drug product. And if necessary, they do uh, update the product specific guidance. All right, thank you for that information. 
Um, we'll move on now to some questions um, for Dr. Kara Scheibner. First question, Kara, um, why should it be U.S. license reference? Hi, thanks. That's a great question. Um, so um, when you're applying um, for a biosimilar application, you're applying for the U.S. market. And so therefore, um, since it will be available in the U.S. market, it must be similar to the U.S. licensed drug that the patients already have access to. All right. Thank you for that response. Another question for you. What kind of analytical technique um, is preferable for immunogenicity assays? Thanks. That's a great question. Um, there really isn't what I would say is a preferred technique. Um, I, I'd like to say the one that works the best is the preferred technique. Um, but, you know, some methods, um, say an ELISA assay versus an electrochemiluminescence assay, um, may be more suitable for some drugs compared to others. Um, there's different characteristics for each of the different types of, of ligand binding assays. And so it's really the best best method that can be optimized for your needs um, to be sensitive and specific and also to kind of avoid a lot of those interferences I, I mentioned during my talk. Um, for neutralizing antibody assays, um, sometimes a cell-based assay may be more relevant, um, again, depending on the drug um, and depending on the mechanism of action. Um, and so, again, I always, we always encourage you to, you know, consult with your respective re review division um, if you have any questions about specific assay types or techniques that you want to use for these studies. All right. Thank you for that response. Another question for you, Dr. Schreiber. Um, what approach would you prefer for biosimilar bioanalytical assessment? Option A, a single assay suitability, single assay to assess both biosimilar and innovator, or option B, separate methods for innovator and biosimilar? It's another great question. And um, the, the preference has really become um, using a single assay that would assess both the biosimilar and the innovator at the same time. All right, thank you for clarifying that. Um, we actually have a, another question that came in for Dr. Jang. Um, the request is to please focus on variables measured in PD. Thank you for that question. Um, that's also a great question. Uh, Based on the uh, CFR CFR 320 28 um, correlation of bioavailability with acute pharmacological effect or clinical evidence, um, the correlation of in vivo bioavailability data with acute pharmacological effect or clinical evidence of safety and effectiveness may be required if needed to establish the clinical significance of a special claim. For example, in the case of extended release preparation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, now we have a question again for um, Dr. Scheibner. Uh, why is immunogenicity so important for large molecule studies? Sure, thanks. Um, so as I mentioned in my talk, um, the um, anti-drug antibodies or ADAs um, can actually affect the PK profile of the drug um, and thus can lead to um, an effect in efficacy. Um, this could, for example, lead to lower drug concentrations um, in patient populations. Um, and obviously that would be really detrimental to a patient who was on the licensed drug and expecting a certain um, amount of, of drug in their system. And now they were taking a biosimilar and that was lessened. 
Um, so again, that's why it's really important to make sure that the immunogenicity between a biosimilar and the licensed drug is comparable. Um, and again, also for things like um, adverse reactions and um, anaphylaxis, injection site reactions and all of that are also big factors in, in that. Great, thank you so much for that response. Looks like that is all the questions we might have time for in this session. Um, thank you again to all our presenters and panelists for all the great information that's been shared.